What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome back to our 24th example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now, today's example video is going to be corresponding to the lecture video on creating new fields. And this will be the final course video for our abstract algebra series. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into this first example here. Now, this first example is to prove that z2 adjoin x mod x cubed plus x plus 1 is isomorphic to z2 adjoin x mod x cubed plus x squared plus 1. So to start this one off, we are going to use a result. And so to begin this one, we want to go ahead and note that z2 adjoin x mod x cubed plus x plus 1 as well as z2 adjoin x mod x cubed plus x squared plus 1 are both fields of order 8. So that means they both have 8 elements. And then we can, uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and prove a result for you guys. I'll make the rest of this problem trivial. And that is that if P is a prime and we have two fields, let's just call them E and E prime, that are, like I said, both fields of order p to the n, then we have that e is isomorphic to e prime. So if we have two fields of the order of a power of a prime, then they must be isomorphic. And of course, since these two are both fields of order 8, that means they will be isomorphic by this result. Now, you could also do this with an isomorphism theorem. I actually worked that out before finding this result here. So if you want to do that, maybe post about it in the comments and so let's go ahead and get to this proof. So we're going to note that both E and E prime have Z sub P as a prime, and that is up to isomorphism. So what does that mean? Well, that means that E is a simple extension of degree N, and also that E is isomorphic to Z sub P adjoin X mod out F of X where f of x is some function which is irreducible. And that is a field. So that means that, like I said, f of x is irreducible. And it also must be of degree n. So since all the elements, we'll just call them little e and big E, are zeros of our zeros of x to the p to the n minus x, that's just by the definition, we know that f of x is a factor of x to the p to the n minus x, but e prime also contains zeros of x to the p to the n minus x. And since e prime has zeros of f of x, which like I said earlier is irreducible in z sub p adjoin x, that means that e prime has p to the n elements. That means that e prime must have p to the n elements and that e prime is isomorphic to z sub p adjoin x mod out f of x, which is from earlier from the earlier statement isomorphic to e. And since we have the if you look at the extreme left and right hand sides, that will finish this result off. So there we've proved that two fields which are both of the order of some power of a prime must be isomorphic. And since the two fields given in our result are both of order eight, which is of course two to the power of three, the two fields must be isomorphic, which completes this example. So let's go ahead and look at the next one. So for the next example, we want to construct a finite field of order 16. This will follow directly from the methods in the example video where we were talked about constructing fields of a specific order. So for this particular example, what we want is z2 adjoin x mod out some function f of x where f of x is irreducible in z2. But we also want the but we also want f of x to be a polynomial of order 4 because if we take z2 and mod it out by an irreducible polynomial of order 4, we will generate a field of order 2 to the fourth power, which is of course equal to 16. So now all we have to do is show that, so now all we have to do is 
find a polynomial which is of order 4 and irreducible in z2, which is not too difficult. Let's consider the function f of x is equal to x to the fourth plus x plus 1. Great. So next we want to construct a field, finite field of order 25. And similarly to the last one, we want to we want to create a finite field of order 25. So note that 25 is 5 squared. So we want to find a polynomial of a degree 2 that is irreducible in z5. And when we do that, we will create a field of order 5 to the second power, which is of course equal to 25. So let's go ahead and note that one such polynomial is f of x is equal to x squared plus x plus 1, which, like I said, gives us the field z sub 5 adjoin x mod out that polynomial x squared plus x plus 1. And I guess for the last one, I didn't actually write out the field, but it would have been z2 adjoin x mod out that polynomial that we had there. Great. So let's go ahead and get to the next example. So for this example, we're going to define the cyclotomic polynomial in the following way, where we have 1 minus x to the n over 1 minus x, which is equal to the series x to the n minus 1 plus x to the n minus 2 all the way up to x plus 1. And we want to show that for any prime p, a cyclotomic polynomial is irreducible over q, or the rationals. And in order to do this, we are going to use Eisenstein's criterion. Uh, if you recall that Eisenstein's criterion had a bunch of conditions that needed to be met to show something is irreducible over q. And so we're going to do that now. So we're going to consider a function f of x, which is equal to our polynomial here evaluated at x plus 1. So once we plug that in, we'll get x plus 1 to the p minus 1 over x over x. And that's going to be equal to x to the p minus 1 plus p choose 1 times x to the p minus 2 all the way up to p choose p minus 2 times x plus p choose p minus 1. And we can see that this will in fact do it as this series expansion fits all of the criteria that we want in order to apply Eisenstein's criterion. We can see that all these terms are divisible by p. Our last term is not divisible by p squared. And everything else we need is taken care of. So this means by Eisenstein's criterion that our f of x is irreducible over q. But what that means is that the cyclic that the cyclotomic polynomial evaluated for any prime is irreducible in the rationals. Great. So for our next example, we want to show that f of x, which is in the field f adjoin x, has no repeated factors if and only if f of x and f prime of x are relatively prime. So I'm going to do something that is, I'm going to prove something that is equivalent to this. So let's go ahead and suppose that a is a multiple root of f of x. Well, by definition, that means that f of x must be equal to x minus a to the k power times some other function g of x, where g of x is an element of f adjoin x. And also, k must be greater than or equal to 2. Otherwise, this will not be a repeated root. It'll just be a single root. Well, just using normal differentiation there, that means that f prime of x will equal k times x to the minus a to the k minus 1 times g prime of x. However, since k minus 1 is greater than or equal to 1, we have that we can write f prime of x in the following way, where it's equal to x minus a to the k minus 1 times this big thing here, where we have k times g of x plus x minus a times g prime of x. Great. And we know that this has a root and we know that this has a root as well. And so we're going to suppose, and so next we're going to suppose that f of x and f prime of x share, share a as a root. And we needed to prove that f prime of x had a root in order to be able to make this supposition. Well, that means that f of x is equal to x minus a times g of x, once again with g of x in f adjoint x. And as well, f prime of x is equal to g of x plus x minus a times times g prime of x. Now, since f prime evaluated at a is 0 and g evaluated at a is 0, we have that g of x is equal to x minus a times some other function. Let's just call that h of x, 
with h of x, which is in f adjoin x, and that's just by the fact that a is a root for g of x as well. Well, that means that f of x is equal to x minus a squared times h of x, just by substitution there. And we can see there that a is a multiple root of f of x. And that completes this proof. So let's go ahead and get to the next one. So for this one, we want to show that the number of irreducible polynomials of the form x squared plus ax plus b, which is in z sub p adjoint x, is equal to p times p minus 1 over 2. And so first we want to observe that we have p squared choices for our polynomial there, x squared plus ax plus b. And let's just go ahead and call this f of x. And so that is because we have p choices for our a as well as p choices for our b. So we have p times p possible choices, which is p squared. So that is the total number of choices for the polynomial. And so now what we're going to do is subtract the number of reducible polynomial choices from the total number of choices, and then all we will have left are the irreducible choices. And so let's go ahead and start with the reducible choices. So if the polynomial is reducible in z sub p, that means that we can write it in the following form. So it can be written in the form x minus c times x minus d. And that'll be with the roots being c and d, of course. And so what we want to know in the question we have to answer is how many of the is how many reducible is how many reducible polynomials are there how many and like i said once we know that we can subtract it from p squared so let's go ahead and take this case by case so for case one that we will consider when c is equal to d well since c is equal to d we only have p choices for that one there the second choice is if p is not equal to d and so we have to be a little more careful with this one. That'll give us p times p minus 1 possible choices. But since, but we want to make sure we don't double count any of the cases which are repeated. So we have to divide by 2 here. So we can see that if we add those up, we will have p plus p times p minus 1 over 2 possible choices. So in order to find the amount of irreducible choices, we will have to subtract that from p squared. So we have p squared minus p plus p times p minus 1 all over 2. Um, and that will give us the amount of irreducible choices. So just doing normal algebra stuff now, we have p squared minus, and we're going to factor out a p over 2, and that's going to give us inside the parentheses 2 plus p minus 1, which is equal to p squared minus p over 2 times p plus 1. Great. So now we're going to bring that p back inside and keep that one half on the outside. So we'll have one half times two p squared minus p times p plus one. But that's equal to one half times two p squared minus p squared minus p. And now we can take that p squared away from our two p squared, and that'll give us one half p squared minus p. And lastly, we can finish this off now. We will have p times p minus one all over two. So that finishes this problem off. So let's get into our final example. So for the final example of this example video, we are going to prove the rational root theorem. That is, if we have some rational number r over s with GCD of r and s equal to 1, being a root of the polynomial p of x is equal to a sub n to the times x to the n plus all the way up to a sub naught is in z adjoined x, then r divides a naught and s divides a to the n. So we're going to suppose r over s is a root of p of x. Well, that means that our polynomial evaluated r to the s is equal to 0, or that a sub n times r over s to the n plus all the way up to a sub 1 times r over s plus a sub naught is equal to 0. We can bring that power into our r to the n and our s to the n so that we can separate our variables r and s. Now I'm going to go ahead and blue, put a blue star here because we are going to return to this equation once we are done manipulating it this first time. So let's go ahead and get rid of the s's in our denominator. So that will give us a sub n times r to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times r to the n minus 1 times s all the way up to a sub 1 times r to the s to the n minus 1 plus a sub naught times s sub n. And so now in order to, to, to prove the divisibility rule for our first coefficient, we're going to solve for a sub n times r to the n. And so we'll just subtract all those terms to the other side. So that'll give us a sub n times r to the n is equal to negative a sub n minus 1 times r to the n minus 1 times s minus all the way down to a sub n times s to the n. 
and you can see that we can just factor out a and s there but we might as well just factor out a negative s to make it look the stuff in the parentheses look better so we'll have negative s times a sub n minus one times r to the n minus one added all the way up to a sub naught times s to the n minus one and so we can see that is all we needed to do is we wrote this as a product of s and some stuff there so that we now know that s must divide our a sub n so next we want to solve that original equation that I still have at the top there. And this time we're going to solve it for a sub naught, just using a similar argumentation to prove the divisibility rule for a sub naught. So once we solve for a sub naught times s to the n, we will have that a sub naught times s to the n is equal to negative a sub n times r to the n minus all the way down to a sub 1 times r times s to the n minus 1. And just like before, we can factor out a negative r to get negative r times a sub n times r to the n minus 1 plus all the way down to a sub 1 times s to the n minus 1. And just like before, that means that r divides a naught. And I just realized that I accidentally wrote this as s divides a to the n times r, uh, r to the n, which is not correct. We have here that s divides a sub n. Great. So that finishes this last problem off of this example video and I guess the last problem off of this entire course. Thank you all for watching and that's a good place to stop.